Today is February 17, 2015. Uh, my name is Jerry Gill, and I'm interviewing George Douglas Doug Scott in the Oklahoma Conference Ministry Center in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. This interview will be filed in the archives of the Oklahoma Conference of the United Methodist Church and in the archives of the Oklahoma History Center. It will also be available online on the website of the Oklahoma Historical Society. Doug, thanks for, uh, and I'm going to refer to you as, as, as Doug, although I know you've got George Douglas Scott. Well, you've always known me about Doug, so. Well, Doug, first of all, uh, we just talked a little bit about your early uh, life, a little bit of uh, personal information about yourself, you know, your parents, where you grew up, uh, early formative experiences. I grew up in Hughes County, a little community called Yeager, which is situated between Holdenville and Wetumpka. Uh, I was raised by my grandparents, uh, and. Um, my grandfather was Lily Harjo, who was a circuit rider when I was growing up. Um, I was born in 1938, so that tells you how far back I can go. Um, um, I grew up in the Methodist church, uh, the community church, um, and it was called the Salt Creek, Salt Creek, Salt Creek Community. It's, uh, I grew up in that area. I attended high school at Yeager. Uh, all my relatives are there, uh, uh, so that's home. In Salt Creek is a fairly historic. Uh, uh, the first time we find anything about Salt Creek uh, is, in, is in 1879, when we review some of the um, some of the records in the uh, in the conference records or in the district records, uh, we find it first being mentioned. <laughs> Uh, Salt Creek, from what the history that we've been able to ascertain, is that it spun off from another church called Tigobachi. Tigobachi is a Greek word that is a tribal town. Uh, the original church or the original site of Tigobachi was at uh, a little place uh, right east of Hannah, Oklahoma, right on the Arkansas, not the Arkansas, but the, but the North Canadian River or the South Canadian River. Uh, and it's, uh, and that's where, that's where the removal of our tribe from Alabama, Georgia, and Florida, that's where, that's where one of the first settlements was located. And as the tribes and as the groups moved, they moved to an area called, uh, which is now Salt Creek, which is about six, eight miles north of Holdenville. Um, and that's become an area where Ticklebutchies, uh, as a tribal town, was begun to form. And the first church that comes out of that area was Tigobachi, and Salt Creek spun off of that church. Well, could you discuss a little bit your, your tribal affiliation, maybe some of the, well, let me back up and ask, first of all, you mentioned uh, as a, uh, your grandparents raised in, and of course the Harjo family is famous in, in Native American Methodism. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your um, experiences as a Native American Methodist, uh, spiritual values, traditions, and worship forms? Uh, they're perhaps a little unique or different maybe to the Native American churches? Well, from a week and from what I can gather and understand um, the Methodism, um, uh, the, uh, when I was growing up, um, my grandfather was a medicine man at, at the Tegobuchi stomp grounds, square grounds, ceremonial grounds, they're, they're referred to in a number of ways. Uh, and my grandfather uh, married into the Long family. My grandmother was a Long, uh, and, uh, and my grandfather had to give up his ways in order, my, in order, to, gra in order, to, mar in order m to marry my grandmother. Uh, if you if you look at the, the history 
other ceremonial grounds and the Methodist, Indian Methodist churches in our area. The church borrowed a lot of things from the ceremonial grounds, like the deacons, uh, which in our stone ground areas, uh, they, were, they were called, they spoke, uh, they were the talkers. Imbunayas, uh, Sabunayas, uh, they, they, to a certain extent, they talk for the grounds, almost like what we have now as the deacons of the church who goes around and makes sure that everything's taken care of on the church grounds. Uh, our, ch our churches face east, uh, all of our churches face east, um, at, least, at least in my tribe. Um, uh, and all the ceremonial grounds f face east, and there's an opening. Men and women sit on one side, uh, um, and, and men and women did sit with one another, uh, and families didn't sit in one another as, as I was growing up. Uh, our churches, uh, a lot of our churches uh, that exist now, uh, the Dawes Commission gave an acre which is a federal trust property uh, that they gave to the churches, uh, which our church is part of. Uh, so there is uh, a lot of intermingling of tradition and rituals that came from the ceremonial grounds that we do in our churches. Doug, uh, the liturgy, how does it, uh, is the liturgy a little different in the Native American church? Could you describe that briefly? I think the culture among our people is very different from the from the majority, uh, the major culture of, of of the Methodist Church that you're going to find. Uh, there has been a couple of historical pieces of paper written, social and cultural differences, and one of the best PhD dissertation papers that I've read is a lady from San Francisco State uh, of a few years ago uh, wrote her dissertation. And it describes the difference uh, in our people and I guess you would say the mainstream Methodism. Uh, her conclusion was that probably, probably, the, probably the Indian churches will never completely absorb the Methodist uh, the doctrines. Uh, one of the things I think a lot of our people believe in is they, they believe in the open door concept, the open mind concept. Everybody's welcome, whether you're Presbyterian, Catholic, Hindu, Buddha, everybody's, and anybody is, uh, is, um, is acceptable in our church. Uh, we don't discriminate against who, who gets behind our pulpit. We don't go ask the superintendent or the bishop who can speak. Uh, it's a, in our community, it's an open door. If you come, if you're a man of the cloth, then you have access to our pulpit. So I think there is a lot of difference uh, between uh, how we conduct our services and how, 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 uh, how the mainstream Methodist churches conduct their Jerry, pause whenever you're ready. Doug, uh, you've been active in, in uh, Native American issues, you know, uh, state and local level, but also nationally. Uh, can you discuss a little bit about your activities in the Native American uh, leadership roles? I guess if you want to talk about leadership roles, uh, when I graduated from the University of Chicago with my master's in 60, 69, or 68, I guess. Um, we had a new commissioner who came into the Bureau in Washington, D.C. by the name of Louis R. Bruce. And um, uh, when I graduated from Chicago, um, I was working on the north side with, uh, uh, with some schools and he came by and saw the uh, storefront school that we were running. And 
a few months later, I got a call from his office asking me if I'd come to Washington. Uh, and for about eight months, um, I commuted to Washington from Chicago. And we worked on a new policy direction for the, the reservations, uh, not only in education, but in all phases. Um, and, and, and in the spring of, of 1970, there were about 16 of us that had been working on new policy directions uh, that, that we needed to give to the president uh, and that he could initiate. And in the spring of um, 1970, he called us back together in Washington. And um, the, all the 16 people that were there, uh, he's, he, he said, these are the folks that I want to help run my administration. And every one of us was on that list. And that's how I wound up in Washington as a deputy director for education for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, I had some close relationship with the subcommittees on Indian policy, both in the House and Senate. Uh, I can remember sitting at DuPont Circle one night with a staff member by the name of uh, Alan Lovesey, who at the time was a staffer f for Mike Blewett who was a representative from the state of Iowa. And we sit at this table, uh, had supper, and I guess we're on about our second or third glass of wine. When he said, he said, I want to do something. He said, we want to write new legislation. And that was the beginning of what was known as the Indian in Education Self-Determination Act. Uh, which gave broader authority to tribes across the United States to contract for schools, contract for other f things at, at that point in time that the government was operating and running for the tribes. Uh, and it all started on a napkin, on a table, and um, as he began to diagram and as we began to give him some input on how this, how this should go. And a couple of years later, major legislation was published. Um, and, and now, I would say, in most of the reservations across the country now, probably 80, 90 percent of the responsibility is now in the hands of the tribes. And, um, Good, bad, or indifferent, uh, I think that was one way that it had to go. Uh, unfortunately, when this time was being done, uh, we had a president by the name of Nixon. Uh, in my opinion, he probably did more for Indians in this country than any other president has ever done. Even though I disagreed, uh, he tried to become king of the U.S., but uh, that's another story. But uh, we have to give him credit that he did a lot for Indians. He gave, he, he gave Blue Lake back to the Pueblos. Uh, he gave a lot of uh, things back to the tribes, but the big thing he gave to, back to the tribes was their own self-determination that they could conduct among their own people. Doug, you've uh, also been a historian and, and recorder of uh, local history. You've served in several capacities. Could you talk a little bit about uh, the historian some of your things? I'm not really a historian, but I have a love for history. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, I serve on the OIMC Archives and History for uh, about seven years. Um, and in my tenure, we uh, we did solicit some funds from some of the tribes and um, a person you'll interview later in the day is Homer Noli. He's the individual who's writing the book now. 
Uh, I've tried to put together uh, summaries of all the Indian churches that we have. So that's been kind of what we've been doing. Uh, uh, I do now serve on the General Commission on Archives and History. Uh, and this will be my last year. Uh, we brought the convocation to OCU in 2011, um, uh, which, is, which the convocation had never been held in Oklahoma or in the Southeast jurisdiction before. Uh, and so that's kind of that's that's kind of where we're at right now. And uh, I've I've been peddling around working our local histories, um, historical societies. Uh, um, we we've been attempting to do some work uh, to interpret some some language stuff that's been written in our language at the at the Oklahoma Historical Historical Center and. Uh, try to generate some funds for them so they can get to those interpreted. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm heavily into genealogy of our people and things like that. And so. Speaking of history, the historically the relationship of the Native American community within the Methodist Church has been, uh, some would say, complex perhaps. Uh, but I want to ask you kind of a series of questions about your perspective on the relationships within the, the Native American Church within Methodism. Uh, first of all, uh, you mentioned Homer. You know, Homer only mentioned in his book uh, that uh, uh, there had been, quote, successful missions and also spectacular failures in efforts with Native American people. Uh, what, can you identify with some of the spectacular failures from your perspective on those? I think one of the major failures uh, as you know, uh, the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference is a forerunner of Methodism in Oklahoma. It was, it was um, established in, in 1844 at Riley's Mission around Tahlequah. And so um, I think one of the things that you're going to find with the Oklahoma Conference is that they've never really understood the history of, the, of Methodism in Oklahoma, even though there's been a lot written about it. Um, uh, one of the major failures that I have seen, or I have read about, not seen, I guess, because that was before my time, but uh, when Oklahoma became a state, and I think it was about 18, about 1906, they combined the two, t t two conferences. They combined the Oklahoma Conference uh, with the OIMC Conference. Uh, you saw a, a number of churches that that um, uh, did not um, had left the conference, especially the Cherokees. We lost many Cherokee churches because of that of the joint of the joint venture. And it wasn't until about 1816, I mean 1916, 1917, when somebody finally wised up and said, "Hey, this ain't working." So they separated, out, they separated out the Oklahoma Conference again, Oklahoma Indian Conference again. So it's become a separate conference. Um, in fact, a man from Virginia by the name of Brewer um, uh, provided the funds for the conference uh, from, for about three or four years so it could get back, its, back on its feet. So since about 1920, we saw a lot of Indian churches uh, who abandoned, who abandoned the Oklahoma Conference. Um, uh, and, and I think that was one of the worst mistakes they could have made was combine the two, combine the two conferences. Uh, the, the, we have a vast cultural differences. Uh, the Oklahoma Conference used to be called the language conference because uh, when I was growing up, most of the sermons, most of the singing, most of the things that transpired, the Sunday school services, was all conducted in our language. Uh, today, uh, that is not so. Uh, we, uh, even though the tribes are attempting to revive the languages, um, um, but the cultural differences, I think, still exist. Doug, uh, picking up on your theme about the merger, uh, uh, some have used the word assimilation as one of the uh, failures, if you will, of, of, uh, of the uh, church in terms of missionary work. Uh, 
wanting to make the red men more like the white men, uh, some of the things that happened in boarding schools, etc., trying to you know, sort of remake them socially and otherwise. Can you speak to that? Uh, uh, serving in the Bureau, I, I had a chance to travel across the country and, and, uh, and visit many of the reservations. Uh, especially the schools, since I was a deputy, uh, I had major responsibilities for our schools. Uh, there's a lot of pro and con, even among ourselves, I think, as Indian people. Uh, uh, you see the, you see the, you see the assimilation process. Some of it has worked. Some of it has not worked. Uh, as long as I think uh, there's a major cultural differences, uh, uh, historically, I think uh, the sociologists, the anthropologists have contributed to a lot of uh, the problems. And also the church has contributed a lot to the problem of assimilation. Uh, uh, you can't make people s something they don't want to be. Um, and uh, I have talked to a, uh, a number of individuals and, uh, uh, and, I, and, and posed the question, why did so many of our people accept, accept, accept religion or, or Christianity? Um, and I've never gotten a good answer. Um, uh, the, the only answer that I've heard that may make some sense to me is that uh, um, what they had to go through with the removal and, and then after they got here and then the Civil War and then uh, getting the loss of a lot of their lands uh, and territory, uh, it uh, they were looking for something they could, that they could hang on to. And um, even though the tribes had their own spirituality and their religious be beliefs, um, uh, a lot of the five tribes, if you look uh, in Oklahoma, have, have become Christians. Um, uh, until recent years, and and I think what we're seeing now is I think you're seeing some major departures uh, from that. And as as our people become more educated and uh, and and um, and more experienced, they begin to begin to question a lot of the things that uh, they've been told were true. Um, and, and, and if things don't change as a church to, to protect its, its minority groups, um, I, think, I think you're going to see a departure of a lot of our, a lot of our minority people from the church. Doug, it's been stated also that over the years that the, uh, sort of the policies, if you will, of the Methodist church imposed, if you will, sometimes on the, on the tribes without their previous input, and then they were then asked to uh, carry out the, those uh, those policies. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, let's look at what's been happening here recently. The act of repentance that the Methodist Church has been going through. Now, this is just my opinion. This is me. I'm not speaking for my church or for anybody else but me. Um, to me, the act of repentance has, has become a showcase, kind of for the Methodists. If the church wants to apologize, just apologize. Simply say, we're sorry we did this to you folks, and we'll try to keep it from happening again. But that's not what's happening. We had a showcase in Tampa. It was called an act of repentance. We had uh, George Tinker, who's a Lutheran, from Colorado, 
who, who, was a, who, who, who was the main spokesman for the Methodists. Why did we need a Lutheran to speak for the Methodist, Indian Methodist? I mean, why? I mean, that's, that's, that's a sad commentary, you know. It's, uh, surely we've got Indian Methodists that could have spoke up for us. I mean, yeah, I love George dearly. I know him well, uh, but uh, he's a Lutheran, you know. And, uh, and why should, why should he, he speak for Methodism? Surely we've got Indian Methodists that can speak you know, uh, uh, and um, that's that's one area. And if the and if the church, when I say the church, I'm talking about about the Methodist Church as a whole. Uh, if they want to be serious about repentance, there are a number of things in the discipline that needs to be repealed. And one of those that needs to be repealed is that um, is is that part where the church says that they own the property that our church is set on. And we wholly disagree with that. Um, and if they want to repeal that section, give, that, give those lands back to the Indians again, back to the tribes, back to the local churches. Let them run their own churches. There's an old African saying, uh, when the missionaries went to Africa, the Africans will tell you that um, when y'all came, y'all had the book and we had the land. And now you've got, you've got the land and now we've got the book. And you can see those kind of parallels. Uh, the federal government chased our people out of the southeast. They come to Oklahoma. And, uh, and then the state, uh, uh, and the federal government uh, takes over the lands after the Civil War. Uh, it reduced the, uh, our property. I mean, uh, uh, there, are, there, are, there are a lot of things I think that, that can be looked at. I mean, you looked, at, you looked at, at the major committees in the Methodist Church. How many Indians are on those boards? Not very many. Uh, has there been an Indian bishop? We've had some good people in the past. There has never been a, a, an Indian bishop. Uh, why? I mean, those are questions that some of our people are asking. You know. Then, obviously, and we hope that there were some successful. <laughs> Is uh, Home Road to point out some successful missionary activities as well? Can you point out some of the, the positives of the missionary work and interaction of the Native American community with the Methodist Church? Uh, when I was growing up, the Methodists in our church had programs. Um, uh, we had youth, MYF, as I remembered it. Uh, you had the intermediates. Uh, also, uh, we had camps. We had Camp Burke, <coughs> uh, just north of Okmulgee. We had Turner Falls that, were, uh, that we used to go to every summer as youth. Those kind of programs don't exist anymore. For why, I don't know. But uh, uh, I think those were great programs for our kids. It was for me. Uh, uh, and I think, I think one thing that, uh, that we need to be successful about is our youth. If we don't take care of our youth, um, I think, um, I think, uh, I think we're going to lose the adult population. Uh, there has been successes. Uh, uh, I think the church as a whole, um, have, um, have brought um, a lot of, um, I would say, opinions of varying degrees to our local local churches, and probably more is needed. Um, uh, even even to participate in the general conferences, uh, our people learn. 
Uh, as for me, um, in belonging to the General Commission on Archives and History, uh, I've learned a lot. Uh, I've been able to bring a lot of the stuff back home uh, to give back to our people. Uh, but uh, uh, success, I guess, is a word that can be relative, I guess. Um, and, uh, and I'm not so sure that as a church that we've been successful. Is uh, if our goal and is to uh, is to spread the gospel and to make disciples uh, of ourselves and future generations, I don't think we've done a very good job. focus on some things that aren't necessarily direct actions in the Methodist Church, but <clears throat> Native Americans traditionally will recount uh, some of those pivotal events in the history of American Indian tribes uh, when uh, the Methodist Church failed to support uh, and protect Native Americans and from their perspective from harmful things. And, and for example, uh, speaking one here is what was, you know, the, the missionaries were preaching love and in the gospel one hand and then were condoning some actions that perhaps were uh, uh, destructive to the, <clears throat> to the people. And of course one of those you alluded to earlier was the removal thing here of the, you know, the five uh, tribes in, in southeast of the United States and relocation into to Indian territory. What was, the, Dave, from your perspective, what was the, uh, what was the, the impact and the consequences of, of that removal uh, on the uh, Native Americans that, that went on that trail of tears, if you will? Uh, Jerry, uh, again, define impact for me, would you? I mean, impact. It yeah. affect their, their lives, their spiritual lives, their socioeconomic development, uh, their, their relationship to the land that was sacred to them, you know, these kinds of issues. Well, when you uproot a group of people that lived in an area for as long as they can remember, and you transport them to a different posi different place, um, the impact it's gonna have on them is gonna be severe. Uh, when the bayonets and you're rounded up and you're force marched um, in the middle of a snowstorm and uh, you capsize st st steamboats uh, on the Mississippi River and lose a number of your people and you bury your dead um, along the road. I mean, what kind of impact is that going to have on anybody? Uh, um, and then, and arrive in Oklahoma in the middle of winter, can have to survive. And when they finally get their life put back together, and then you have the Civil War, where a lot of them had to go south of the Red River into Texas uh, to, to escape some of the prosecutions. Um, as you can see in our tribe, among the creeks, we, we were split, uh, south and north. Uh, my grand, great grandmother was a Yehola. Her father was a Yehola, and she was related to a man by the name of Obithi Yehola. Uh, he was a union sympathizer, and you know the history of Oklahoma of him going to Kansas and fighting, fighting his own people in the Seminoles uh, and the Cherokees uh, to move his bunch into Kansas. And then after he gets to Kansas, um, he's not given any relief from the unions. So um, um, and the impact it had on the land, uh, I mean, how do you? I mean, how how does anybody justify moving somebody from something that is their home? And they had to re restructure, uh, regroup. Because uh, um, see, so you got to understand <coughs> uh, b before the removal, the tribes had had some of the most edu prolific of some of the best education systems in the country that far, far exceeded even, even the non-Indians who live in those areas. 
A good example is the Choctaw Academy, you know, uh, in Tennessee. Uh, um, uh, the impact, uh, I think, has been enormous, but those days, I think, keeps being brought up uh, over and over again. And I think the act of repentance is another f form of bringing those wounds up again. Uh, uh, the impact, uh, I don't think you can measure. You know, I think it's, it's by the grace of God that we've survived. You mentioned earlier to the Civil War and Reconstruction. What were the, the long-range consequences of the, of the division within the tribes and the, and the re, you know, quote, Reconstruction after the war on the five tribes? Well, among the five tribes, one of the, one of the black marks it has is that they were slave owners also. Uh, you had plantations in the south. Um, Southeast Alabama, Georgia. Uh, even before removal, you had uh, you had slaves, and in um, in uh, the removal, a lot of the slaves uh, came with the tribes. I remember on my grand great my great grandmother's place um, with her allotment. Um, on the allotment lived a couple of families of blacks, um, and always wondered. How come, how come they're there? Come to find out that they were, they come from a generation of slaves that uh, that came with the family, that uh, lived. Uh, um, and uh, unfortunately, that's some of the stuff that, uh, as Creeks, we had to deal with. Uh, one of the major, I think, impacts that, uh, that the Civil War had was that just like anybody else, you had people who believed in slavery and you had people who, who didn't believe in slavery. And it's just like the North and South, uh, you have, uh, and it wasn't what, until about 1938 until, until, you, until you got the Methodist South and they finally combined. But, but you still got the Baptists who still got Southern Baptists, which hasn't, uh, I guess, relinquished their part of, uh, part of the slavery part yet. I don't know. But, um, uh, and, uh, but I think the biggest impact that the Civil War had on us is that um, even though half of us fought for the Union, half of us fought for the South, when it, when it was all over and done with, um, they, they lumped us all in the same group as Southerners. And, and took a lot of our property away from us. Could you expand on that a little bit, Doug, in terms of the, the treaties of uh, 18, I think around 1866, Reconstruction took away tribal holdings and, and some of the authority they had given right away, to the tribes, et cetera? It took, uh, we lost, we lost, uh, uh, we lost most of Oklahoma. Before uh, uh, the tribes boundaries went as far west as the Texas boundaries, um, it was it was after the Civil War that they gave up all the all the western part of Oklahoma to the governments uh, because a lot of other tribes were being also also transported and herded into western Oklahoma. Um, uh, in, um, and and uh, I guess I guess with the land uh, we lost so much of, n not only that, but families lost their homes and all their livestock. Uh, whether it was the South or whether it was the North, that confiscated them and used them for their own benefits, uh, and having to restructure everything again, and uh, and um, and and the lands being given, and, and then eventually from that point on, 
to the Dawes Commission uh, and in Oklahoma becoming a state. Um, uh, it, uh, at one time, you know, there was a proposal to have a separate Indian state called Sequoia. Um, but the Dawes Commission, the Civil War, probably were the two devastating parts of, um, of dealing with the government. Another area that I think you hear Native Americans sometimes feel like the church didn't step in and support them was uh, during the time of uh, opening of, of the, the land to white settlers in, in uh, Oklahoma. Uh, so white settlement and a lot of tribal lands sort of lost the tribal sovereignty. Can you speak to the Dawes Act and that you mentioned earlier and, and what, what uh, the consequences of that were? Yeah, before we get there, let's go back to the, before the removal. I mean, when the removal was being contemplated, uh, and um, and um, the church, uh, they didn't step in to support non-removals. Uh, we know that. Um, and um, and and when and when the lands were being t t taken away after the Civil War, the church didn't step in. I mean, we, we didn't hear anything from the church. Uh, uh, and the Dawes Commission, uh, we had these lands that was um, as tribal lands. And uh, again, the word assimilation, somebody in their wisdom said the best way to assimilate Indians was to give them access to their own land. So they came up with the idea that each family member would get 160 acres or 80 acres or 40 acres. It depended on where it was located. Um, a lot of the lands uh, were divided um, in, in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, in all you have to do is read Angie Dubose's book in The Road to Disappearance, where it places a pretty heavy indictment on, on the state of Oklahoma and what it did. Overnight, the Choctaws lost. Once the lands were given to individuals, the creeks were given individual lands, also the Cherokees, overnight they were swindled out of their lands. They lost almost 50 to 60 percent of what they owned. Uh, and and as you know, you know Angie Dubow was kind of blackballed by the state of Oklahoma for a number of years until until all this all the history began to come out as being truthful. But uh, that was a that was a sad part in Oklahoma history. Doug, could you speak to the other part of the Dawes Act where the, what it did to the tribal sovereignty and authority? Uh, I think sovereignty is a word that is kind of misused a lot. Um, prior to that, prior to the, uh, uh, there was some called the Oklahoma Indian Welfare Act, and there was a number of legislations that, uh, that took place that, um, that, that gave Indians certain autonomy. To me, the term sovereignty means you control your own destiny. Indians never have, have had that autonomy. Even though we talk about being sovereign nations, we've never been a sovereign nation. Um, and look at uh, look at the stuff that, 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 that that's that's going on between the tribes and the state of Oklahoma um, over taxes, uh, compacts on cigarettes, um, um, casinos. Um, uh, even though we do still have restricted land, uh, we have land that's, that's held in reserve, that's not taxable. Um, uh, I happen to own, inherited some of that, um, and we try to keep it in the family. Uh, uh, the Dawes Commission, basically what it did is it was another instrument to take land away 
from individual Indians. Doug, the, uh, in 1906, you, you mentioned, you alluded to earlier, I think it was around 1906, that the Indian uh, uh, Missionary Conference was dissolved and merged in with the Oklahoma Conference um, under the authority of the jurisdiction of the Oklahoma Conference. Uh, what, what was the effect of that in, in terms of its impact on the Native American churches and church growth? And well, as I said earlier, uh, we lost a lot of churches. Uh, you had, uh, we lost most of the Cherokee churches left. Um, and that was, um, that was, uh, I'm not sure exactly what took place or what happened, but I knew, I know that um, during that period of time, um, a lot of churches, like, like the Cherokee churches left, and there were some Creek churches that also left. And, uh, and now we have approximately five or six independent Methodist churches that, that exist. That's sprung from that. Um, and I guess, I guess the one thing that I guess would have to be addressed is, um, and do Indians want to belong to an organized religion? You know, uh, when they've never been told how to conduct their services. Um, the discipline um, talks about how you conduct uh, communion. In my lifetime, I've seen it go from one aspect to another aspect to another aspect to another aspect. And um, um, it's my belief, uh, being an Indian, that uh, our people are probably more spiritual than they are, and than they are religious. Um, um, and I think maybe that was the impact that that the that the merger brought on. Was that there's a cultural difference, and there always that there will that there will always be a cultural difference uh, 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 until a time comes when um, uh, I guess when I guess when when everybody's skin becomes the, the same tint or whatever it becomes, you know. Um, but then. Uh, I was reading something the other day, and that kind of caught my attention. And um, and uh, it went something like, um, "We were all human beings, and but the church separated us, and the skin skin divided us, and politics did something else to us." So. Um, you, you referenced the uh, repentance and reconciliation movement in the church and the acts of repentance. Uh, the Methodist Church is currently lifting up these uh, these uh, uh, acts of uh, repentance and and recommending that the conferences and the districts and local churches take those up. Can you explain from your perspective? What the intent of the uh, of the movement and the desired outcomes from that movement from the Native Americans? I'm not sure that I really understand what the purpose of the act of repentance was. Um, my only thing of that is, if the church is going to apologize, apologize. You know, I mean, the Baptists have apologized, the Catholics have apologized, the Lutherans have apologized, almost every other religions or denominations have apologized, but the Methodist. Why is it taking them, taking them so long to apologize? Just simply say, hey, we apologize, and let the healing start, and let's get on down the road. Rather than making showcases out of this, uh, I just see it as a sideshow, and it's not good. It's not healthy for our people. And even if, we, if there is going to be an act of repentance, invite us too. 
because we haven't been invited. When the bishops were here a few months ago, and they had a little process of active repentance, you think our churches were invited? You think we were asked to come? No. So, so what does that say? You're not serious. Hey, we were the one that was offended. Aren't we going to participate? Aren't we going to be participants? Probably both to some extent. It is shame. It's guilt. Uh, but it's, it's so easy to say, I'm sorry. Why can't we do it? Why can't the church do it? Let me say this, our churches out there probably can cure less, okay? Because it, it wasn't in their lifetime. It, half of them don't even know what's going on. And I mean, it's, I, th I think it's a sad case uh, uh, that it's that way. But nobody's come out and said, hey, we want to do this. What do you all think about it? I can't tell you what they're thinking. I know what they're not thinking. They're not thinking about the act of repentance. At least that's my opinion. Doug, in your opinion, what's the current status and, and future prospects of churches in OIMC? Have you expressed some reservation earlier about the future? I think what's happened um, is that one of the things that has really disturbed uh, at least my congregation, uh, I say my congregation, my church, my local church, is the amount of increases of apportionments that has gone up considerably in the last five years. Um, the apportionments, the land issue, um, if you visit our churches, if you've been to any of our churches, our churches are poor. Most of our churches are in poor counties uh, where there are no jobs. Uh, our churches don't have the attorneys uh, the doctors uh, in our congregation. These, these are families who live from day to day. Uh, they can't raise the apportionments to meet what the church is asking. Um, I think that will be a major, if things, if there is no relief of any kind coming down the road, um, I think that will be a major detriment that the churches will either not exist or they will leave the conference. Um, the other thing is that our population is getting older. We're not bringing our youth or younger people with us. Um, a case in point, my church, there's about four or five major contributors and are up in age. If anything happens to either one of those people, you know, uh, apportionments will be completely gone. Because most of our families live from day to day. Uh, uh, it's, it's almost like a third world country out there. And nobody seemed to recognize that. We haven't had a visit 
from anybody. You know, um, the major visitation we got was from from the General Commission on Archives and History. That's the first time that anybody's ever come down to our church. You know, we don't get visits from the bishop. We don't get visits from the superintendents. Uh, we ask, we communicate, we write letters, we don't get responses. You know, um, um, but um, there's a lot of concern out there. Following up on that question, what, though, what needs to be done to preserve the unique heritage and ensure the continuing existence of, of Native American churches in, in that particular? Come down and talk to us. Come down and ask us. And that's never been done. We'll tell you, or they'll tell you. No. I think I'm going to give you an open-ended question to end on, okay? Okay. What, what have we not covered that you think should be discussed or is, is significant in the, you know, over the, taking the general perspective the last couple hundred years, if you will, of the, the history of the Native American church within that uh, Something we've forgotten, left out, should have mentioned, didn't. Oh, when I get home, I'll probably think of a lot of things, but um, uh, I guess to sum things up is that um, as people, we are the church. You know, we are the church. I mean, the church can't do anything. It doesn't think, you know, it doesn't move, it has no life. But the people within it makes it happen. Um, and that's kind of the same way uh, that our churches are. Our churches are only as, as good as, as, as who we are. Um, I don't know what has been left out, what needs to be covered right now. Uh, uh, But I do know that there's got to be better communications. Um, people need to come and ask us what we think. That's never been done. You know, and um, um, and they may tell you and they may not. Um, that's just their nature. Um, uh, at one time, I would have said we need the church, the big church, organized church. But as I look and get more experience and see what's going on, uh, see the power struggles in the church, the upper echelon, the bishops getting major increases in salaries and nobody else is, uh, that bothers us. Probably the issue is going to come down is are we going to be a church that believes in making disciples of people and continue in the works of Jesus Christ? Or are we going to be a financial institution that depends on appropriations, apportionments to govern this organized religion? How about That's a, pretty stiff. How about an amen? And uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. You're welcome.